I know you guys are tired and I'm feeling bad we wore you out so much today, but I want you, instead of uh, listening to me talk for a few minutes, tell me something, whatever it is, if you've been to at least one meeting before tonight, because we haven't done this one yet, one thing that you just, just really hits you about God that makes you say amen or thank you, Lord, okay? And uh, yeah, we're going to sort of just run around here a little bit. <clears throat> Well, as simple as, is this on? Yeah. Yep. As simple as it is to, to understand that if you want to have victory over sin, you have to give Jesus your will. That, that is probably the most impact that I, I've gotten so far. Plus, a lot of other things, but that really, as simple as it is, and what we should already know, we sometimes forget. Yep, good. And that's a very useful, helpful one. Way in the back here. That is... That his forgiveness is everlasting. That his forgiveness is everlasting. That's a good one. Anybody else nearby here, right here? Oh, here's one. I, uh, I grew up, I was dumb and stupid and never amounted to nothing in life. And uh, God could not love me. God can love everybody else in the world, but he cannot love me. And uh, this... Um, a few months ago, I learned that I was uh, going blind. And uh, so I said to myself, uh, there's no need to have the operation because uh, I got a cataract. And I got also got toma in my eyes. And so, yes, the doctor told me I could be blind within two or three years. And I said, well, I don't care. I'm not going to do nothing about it. They said, let me go blind. But uh, this weekend, God uh, told me, he says, uh, Larry, I want you to have the operation. This afternoon, I was anointed, and I'm going to be going through the uh, operation. Okay, very good. That's what I learned from the group. Okay, good. Something right here. I told him that everything would be okay if he went through the surgery, and that I needed him. And so I think that might have helped a little. Good, good, that's right. That's pouring the love from God onto him, right? Did you say did you have a hand up? No. This wasn't necessarily just from this weekend, but it's been a lifelong thing. I can't start my day without God or I'm asking for trouble. <laughs> All right. Looking for something specific, though, you heard about God. I've been pondering the, the story of Ananias and Sapphira for a few weeks because that, in that story, it seems to go right from the bad behavior to the death penalty. You know? <laughs> and and after, after the worship hour sermon today, I understand that those folks were probably in an elite group that were probably there at Pentecost, and they should have been plumbed in, and they decided to go the other way. Good, or, and, but it's not. It doesn't say that, right? But in the in the story, which kind of motivates people out of fear, right? But but I know we don't need to be motivated out of fear. Good, that's a good application. Good, good connection to just just a second. Just the idea that if we look at the whole story, which is three and a half years of Jesus, right? And as nice as Sapphira, they were at least hearing about all that stuff. Then comes Pentecost. Right? Then comes all these conversions, and here's the power and the Spirit of God on them. Right? They, they received that, and the, that day with all the speaking in tongues and all that stuff. And then yet, still after that, we see them wanting to lie to whom? As if that was even possible. So apparently they're lying to themselves about what's going on, right? And so this, this now imagine if all of us who had done that ever were just dropped dead like them, how, how many of us would be here? So th this is one, you're right, I think you used the word elite, one for a warning sign, right? That to receive the goodness and the graces of God and then to push it off like that, where's the, where's the ultimate result going to be in that? So good, good observation. You had another thought? Yeah. <clears throat> what I was trying to say is that uh, I learned through uh, what you taught us this weekend so far that uh, God wants me to go through with this surgery. Because he uh, cares about you, He right? cares for me, yes. Good. And, 
He cares and loves me. Good. No matter Amen. what my dad taught me. Amen. Amen. Anything else? Something thought it's on your mind just specific that really hits you you want to share? Anybody up here who's going to sleep? No. <laughs> Not yet. Sure. Um, I get caught a lot in in the exact phrases and what the Bible's saying and trying to figure out, like, I can't put this part together with this part over here. And so trying to under, you know, trying to have a deeper understanding and a faith in the Bible. And so um, when the Bible says, you know, that the Father judges no man, but has left the judgment unto me, Christ's saying that. And then he says, I didn't come to the world to judge. Um, trying to put those together. And I thought it was helpful today to to hear that tied in where it says, you know, the words, or the word, is that what it says? Yep. Okay, the word will we'll judge, judge you. you. Mm -hmm. And so to see that, I guess it's just a rejection of Christ that judges us. Okay, good. Good, good thoughts. Any more? This is sort of help, to help wake you back up. <laughs> um, this is from the last time you were here. I asked you about prayer and... I can I can honestly say I don't remember what you said, but in, instilled in me a desire to figure out what you said, good. whatever it was. Good, that, that, that's good enough. <laughs> and I studied about prayer for probably about five or six months. And the thing that I come up with is that, and I studied prayer probably 20 years ago for a year and did not even come close to what I studied this time. Wow. So it shows you what God will bring you to when you're ready for it. Good. And his character is what we are to be praying. And that's what I studied and what I read and what I learned. And it totally has changed my prayers. Amen. And... You know, I, did, I can't even explain how it's changed my prayers, but it has, and I have seen more answers to prayers because of it. And most of all, it's just praying God's character. Good. You love me. You love my kids. So I don't, this is not one, for instance, I remember for years saying, Lord, watch over my children. Watch over my children. Keep them safe. Bring them to you. When I recognize that, you know what, I don't have to ask God to do that. He is already doing that. When you say to him, God, your character is that you love my children already. So I'm going to leave them in your hands today. You do with them as you know they need. And so it's kind of that kind of prayer that has come from this. And I really have to say thank you for whatever you said to me. <laughs> like I said, I can't remember. <laughs> but it, it made me dig in and, and seek God's character to know how my prayers needed to change. And it, you know, it, it just has been a true blessing true blessing <laughs> good thank you for sharing it, it is amazing isn't it sometimes when it's not really about what i said <laughs> it's it's about something that the holy spirit got in to our thoughts and our minds and starts to unfold over time that's why it's not really the, you know we, we do so much put us up front and talk activity but that's not really what it is um just on that note of, about prayer what i did say was that we don't have to pray to explain to God what needs to be done. Yeah. We don't need to pray to remind him. Or here's another favorite theory that we got to smash with a sledgehammer. He doesn't need us to give him authority or any power. What he needs is for us to surrender to him who loves us so that we will see his will being worked out with spiritual eyes, with eyes that see what he sees, and even more important, to surrender our hearts to him so he can work through us to what? Help others. You know intercessory prayer, since you brought it up? <laughs> intercessory prayer where you spend time in the closet and talk to God, and then you're done and you got to go about your business is not intercessory prayer. God doesn't need your lists. God doesn't need your reminding. That isn't what it's for. Uh, I think I, I gave her a few things to try to go start reading, right? Steps to Christ and Christ's object lessons, a few other places. What we find is that the privilege of prayer 
is for us to be lifted up into the throne room of heaven, to drink him in, to breathe him in. The high priest went into the most holy at the day of atonement not to talk God into helping the people outside. God already knew all about the people outside. That's why Jesus said, God knows what you need before you ask. But, but the high priest went in so that he could behold the glory of God, which was the Shekinah glory in there. Can you imagine that? Going in there and having this, it could have been anywhere from a half an hour to, to a, a nine hour activity. In there, just you and Shekinah glory. And, and if you're in there for even, say, one hour, how many stories would you be able to tell when you came back out to the people who did, who they're so afraid of him, they said to you, no, no, don't let him talk to us. You go in there and talk to him. We're too afraid of that. We're going to tie a rope on your ankle just in case. You know, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> that's a traditional myth kind of part of the story. But, but if they did that, it was because they were afraid. They're not going in there to get him, right? And, and so once again, we see this sort of drawback in fear and afraidness, and God was inviting them in to come in and know him, to help the ones outside who still didn't know him, to bring them in. It, it is a whole different strategy or a whole different, it's not a good word, whole different view of why we come to him in prayer like Steps to Christ and different books written by Mrs. White. But when I got done, most of what I found that changed what I felt or, or think was out of the Bible, yeah. out of other people's prayers. And there's a lot of them in the Bible That's true. that you don't even realize. I mean, some of them are just a few words. Some of them are long paragraphs. But that's where I found... Those prayers work for those men, so why wouldn't they work for me <laughs> or these people? So. That's good, and, and it is true. I usually tell people to go read those prayers and find the parts in those prayers that fit our thinking of prayer, and you'll find they're not there. For instance, you won't find them pleading with God uh, as if he needs to be convinced, especially Jesus. You read Jesus' prayer in John 17, and it's not even in there. In fact, he does a weird thing to me at first. He says, I pray for these ones. I don't pray for those ones. What, what do you mean you don't pray for those ones? I'll let you go study that and figure that one out. <laughs> it doesn't have the same strategy as we normally think. Um, so for tonight, and I'm not going to hopefully belabor this real long, uh, because I just wanted to put this idea in front of you. It's actually connected to that prayer idea. And that is this idea of marked. And that's just because, as Adventists, for so long we've worked on this piece. We've worked on Mark of the Beast and who is the Beast and uh, Mark of that guy and what's his name and all that stuff for a long, long time. But it hasn't really turned us into a people who know how to go out there and love them. It's turned us into a people who knows how to point fingers at them, to put it bluntly. And so we have a seminar that teaches us how to point fingers and be critical. Stop doing it. And so here's what happens. Let's review just a little bit of Babylon. Uh, it starts with, what's his name? Satan. Oh, yeah. That's, I love that. I go right to the point. <laughs> I was thinking Nebuchadnezzar, but you're right. <laughs> Satan. Nebuchadnezzar, remember him? Uh, amazing story. The whole story is very interesting, especially because Daniel has so many intricate parts in this story, and I love the whole story of Daniel. But if we get to the heart of the matter, uh, after all of this stuff that he learned from Daniel, that he heard from Daniel, that he saw in Daniel's three friends, right, who wouldn't bow down, all of this opportunity he had to learn, he still eventually got there on his palace and he looked over what he had built and what did he say? Look what I have built. Okay, then his grandson, Belshazzar, Right? Yeah, Daniel was Belteshazzar. He's Belshazzar. Belshazzar, what was, what was his thought? What my grandfather built is so great and so powerful that there's no way this city's falling. Right? They cannot take this city. And so in peace and safety, he rested, believing that th this place is infallible, would be a, uh, another word we could use for it, uh, indestructible not takeable. <laughs> and, and so he had his feast and all his friends and they celebrated in their, their, their seriously strong belief 
that there's no way this ship's going down. Right? That was the thinking. And you know, of course, the rest of the story, how he's sitting there in the middle of all that peace, peace, and all that, this ship's not going down, trusting in the system and trusting in the, the shape of the organization that his grandfather had built, that then they come in under the wall, right? And the shout went out what? What did they shout? The, the, the watchers on the wall. Babylon, Babylon has fallen. See, they didn't believe that could happen. Didn't believe it was even possible, and yet here it comes. They're shouting, Babylon has fallen. They're not shouting Babylon is falling ahead of time. They're shouting because it, the enemy has come in like a flood, and there was no stopping them. Uh, but let's go backwards in the story. <clears throat> Babylon actually started before Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, Satan. <laughs> but clear back to the Tower of Babel. What was their thinking? Save ourselves what? Save ourselves. Salvation by ourselves. Salvation by works. Uh, we're going to save ourselves from any other impending flood by using our abilities to build a tower so high we can climb right into heaven. Well, that's, that's a wild uh, theology. <laughs> that's a wild theory. Um, so we see this thread, right, <clears throat> running through this. I will set myself up above the most high. I will lord it over, and I will have mastery, and I will have control. It ran through the Tower of Babel. It ran through Nebuchadnezzar. It ran through Belshazzar. It ran through King Saul. Now, that's not a Babylonian. That's an Israelite. It ran through... Who else do we want to put in there? <clears throat> Can you think of any? Oh, yeah. Of course, Pharisees, right? <laughs> this is like the ultimate uh, display of that, where they've got God himself right in front of them, and they're calling him Satan, right? But oh, any others you want to... I mean, there's a bunch, but I don't want to, you know, belabor you with putting them all out there. Yes? At Belshazzar's time? Yeah. Right. Because they had water come in and sent all that they did to catch fish from the river came or something. Good. But, you know, handwriting God's hand. Right. On the wall. Writing and they, none of the, their, all their scribes or sorcerers or whatever um, could. That's right. And was shortly after that, his time, here they come. That's right. I, I skipped that part. I just went to the shouting on the walls. Babylon is falling. You're right. All those pieces are in the story because it's all pointing to the same problem. What were they putting their trust in? Self. self. Either self through building a tower or building a, 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 a castle wall, right? Or, or building this just this false concept of, of peace, Pharisees. Once again, building their construct of, of how this religion must work, and they kind of benefited from that, meaning in their pockets, right? Because they, as long as they kept their construct going, uh, their coffers kept getting full. And, uh, and so you see that thread running all the way through, but you're right, it goes all the way back to Satan, who set himself above the Most High. You see that same theme, that same thread. Uh, the very first one we see is Cain actually, before, as far as humanity goes. Uh, well, we, we could actually work this into Eve and Adam too, right? <laughs> but, but not to work every single piece of this story, uh, you have Cain, and Cain brought to God an offering. And in Cain's mind, why was he bringing the offering? What? His first his, fruit. His, his, out of his garden. So he was bringing his fruits out of his garden, uh, he was bringing this offering to God, but why was he bringing this offering? To appease what? Look, look what I have done. I, I, I got this garden, I tilled this soil, and look what came out of it, right? And so I'm bringing to you, God, this offering which I have made, which I have brought, to please or appease you. See, that, that's right 
right down that line, that same thread that runs all the way through. Actually, you'll see this thread run all the way through the entire history of the scriptures. And the reason I bring it up from this angle <clears throat> is because we've been taught to put our focus on one particular guy or one particular group, right, as if it's them. When the truth is, it is us. It is, it is I, right? When we step forward to set ourselves up as able to be righteous, to make righteousness, to do righteousness, to accomplish something for God, whether, whether it be our preaching, my, I should say my preaching, <laughs> or, or whether it be our prayers, or, or some even want to work it into faith. If I can, Watch, I'm going to now muster enough faith to make it happen. You see how good we are at that? We can take every gift God has given to us and we can flip it over upside down and turn it into a what? Idol. That's what it is. It's an idol. Remember it says no graven image. What is that? What's a graven image? There, there, huh? Handmade, made by man. A graven image of who? Of God. It's a man-made version of God. It's, it's man's way to explain God. The problem is the way we keep explaining him is wrong. So he sent Jesus, of course, that's the good news, right, where we see him explain the truth about God. There is the difference. <clears throat> so this idea of this construct of the little horn, we need to watch for it in a lot of places. A lot of places because we build them. We're the ones building them. And we set them up. Remember that story about... Uh, Gideon, it's kind of an interesting part of the story because uh, we know the part about the fleece and, and the dew and all that. And we know the part about how the angel came or, or Christ came actually to talk to Gideon. And we know the part about the big battle. But do you remember this part? <clears throat> After he spoke to Gideon in the field and he told him, I want you to get an army together. Didn't tell him it had to be like that size <laughs> yet. But he told him, I want you to get an army together. And he says, the first thing I want you to do is what? Go home to your father's house. And there in his front yard is a what? Idol to Baal. Idol to Ashtaroth. Idol to pick a name, right? There, his dad? He's an Israelite. And his dad has got... And then remember the part where the whole town came out? They're all very upset. How dare that young man be so disrespectful of our religion? and come over here and just topple the whole thing, like turning tables over in the temple or something. See, that, that, that thing that rose up in Cain, when he didn't like what was happening, when his brother got fire from heaven, and he did not, it rose up in Cain, and he said, you know what? You're making me look bad. You're messing up my religion. And I'm not, I don't want your religion. We're sticking with mine, so I have to get rid of you. That's papal, and I don't mean Rome. Papal as in the concept of, of now I will take authority over you, and I will decide whether you get to worship the way you want to or not, worship the way you see fit or not. The whole thing with the Protestant movement, it was kind of interesting because, again, I grew up, remember, in class, getting A's, very interested in Bible class, but I never knew I was Protestant. I don't know how I missed that. I'm not saying you all missed it, but that was weird to me because I'm reading about it in the book Great Controversy about Martin Luther, and I'm reading this, and it's explaining what a Protestant is. See, I thought the Protestants were those other people, <laughs> those ones that don't know the truth, that I need to go help. And then here I'm reading, and it's saying uh, a Protestant is to protest what? You remember? Protest any man standing between you in, and God in matters of conscience. That you have the right to go directly to God for your truth and your understanding. Oh, you mean you don't need Bobby to get up and explain it? That's right. God is not dependent upon me to come here and say it. God is not dependent upon you to go tell them to say it. That is to build up, right, once again, a construct of well, which term should we use? <clears throat> Beast power. And, and I know we spent a lot of time in Revelation trying to figure out time periods, and, and I'm trying to sort of work through this subject without all that to say, do you see the problem? We keep building Cain's altar just by the fact that we rush out to try to accomplish righteousness 
trusting myself. Already, we're at Cain's altar. Already, we're, we're come here to do a work for God. Instead of realizing we're in desperate need. As Daniel's prayer, we have sinned before God. We have not represented him right. We have not spoken of him correctly. God knows it's not our fault because we got confused and deceived. But if we don't come to him and say, Lord, we're, we're in trouble. Would you please rescue us, right? It's going to just keep getting worse and worse and worse until finally there's a guy up on the hill and he's looking down and he says, God, you know, your people down there, which I'm one of them, he says, uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty confused, pretty lost, pretty, pretty deceived. You need to do something about that. You know the part right where Elijah was talking to God about how, how messed up things were and how bad the idol worship was? And I, I almost wondered if he wasn't a little bit critical at first, right? Like, God, look how messed up they are. <laughs> but now God keeps talking to him, and pretty soon it changes. This is the part I know for sure, because it says in Prophets and Kings that pretty soon Elijah was crying to the Lord. Elijah was weeping for the the condition of things around Israel, right? And, and, and as he watched that and he was talking to God about God, you got to do something. God says, okay, I will. You go tell the king. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, no, no. You, Lord, you need to do something about that. Yeah, you go tell the king. There's going to be no more rain till you say so. I, I, you know, that really hangs the whole thing on Elijah. Because now they're going to be mad at who? Elijah. Because again, like Cain, when their, when their religion was getting blasphemed against, right, or spoken against, they were out to kill now the guy who brought all this trouble. That's just how it works every single time. With Jesus, it was the same thing. Jesus, much better than Elijah, was the perfect representation of the truth and about God. But I want you to see that thread running all the way through. Babylon. The idea of Babylon and this is, comes right out of great controversy, is the church fallen? That, that, that sentence scares me. The church fallen. And here's what I mean by it scares me. <clears throat> she doesn't choose to tell me which one in that paragraph. See, all before in great controversy, she's going down history, and she shows, see, here's the same thread running in Nebuchadnezzar's life. Here's the same thread running in the Pharisees. Here's the th same thread. And then all of a sudden, she goes generic on me, and she says, the church, fallen. And I'm going, well, wait a minute. I need you to tell me which one. Because if you don't tell me which one, I won't know which one to run away from. I mean, wouldn't you, if you're looking at that, ver that, that, that line, that sentence? And the reason I say that is because God wants us, the way it's written, he wants us to get this from a principle standpoint. It isn't about which one. It isn't about that group or the other group or the group over there. When I was in India, <clears throat> this, this happened to me. I, was, I, was, I got a chance to teach in the seminary. Seventy men, young men, in one classroom. That was, wow, I was like, wow, that's a big class. That's the only classroom they had, and that was the whole of the seminary in India uh, at the conference office there. And so I get these, these men every day for a week, and, now we're gonna, and we worked on this character of God stuff. And, and they, they enjoyed it. They, you know, struggling through it, learned just like all of us do. But I got to Thursday, and I, and I wanted to have a question and answer time with them. I always like to do that. So I said, okay, what questions do you want us to work on in class today? Hands go up. First hand said to me this, I, I want to know, is it more holy to keep your shoes on when you go in the church or take them off? Wow. <laughs> uh, I said to them, you guys have been hanging out with the Pharisees too long. <clears throat> now, I don't know which staff members are, were around when I said that, and they might not have liked that too much, but the reality was, I, well, for them, I told them, I said, well, just tell me. What did God say to Moses? And they said, well, he said, take your shoes off. I said, there you go. Next. <laughs> See, because we get drugged down into these crazy little questions, and the questions that God really needs us to be asking is, what is he like? Who is he that we might behold him? And, and we run around the world. And, and I was thinking to myself, because the second question was, could you explain to us who this guy is in Rome? We don't understand that. And that's because in their, in their uh, society, their, their country or whatever, 
it really doesn't have much to do with anything. They don't have that there. They have Buddhism, they have Hinduism, they have some other isms, right? But they don't have that. And, and so I thought, well, why are we working so hard to talk to them about some guy way over there when, when they need to understand how to deal with it right here? Again, to explain, we need to understand it at its principle, at its core. And here's how it looks in our society, in our environment, in our neighborhood. And I know none of them are here tonight, so that's okay, because it's for you to help them if you see them or find them. They tend to come to church and want to go around and point out everybody's problems to them. They tend to want to say, do you know Ellen White said don't wear that? They tend to want to uh, go to board meeting and, and explain what they don't like about somebody, talk behind people's backs, not just in board meeting. We do it at the house in the afternoon after the sermon. And you say, Bobby, why are you talking about such little details? Because, you know, you're messing up my program. Because that's the way it plays out in our lives. The way it plays out in our lives is we, we, we set ourselves up as a standard. This is out of Thoughts from our Blessings. We set ourselves up as a standard and then we look at everybody else who doesn't meet our standard and we say, yeah, see, you're the problem. You need to leave or stop or change or something. There is only one standard. Who is it? Jesus. That is to be Protestant. To be Protestant is to say there is one truth one example of truth and that's jesus and any other any other thing we pull in to try to say well it's this and it's this and this other thing if you can't match it to where jesus taught it said it did it forget about it that's why paul sends so much time in his letters in the new testament because you had these other religious people coming around and and, and causing that same trouble and so paul has to write to them and he says to the, the things like this oh you foolish galatians who bewitched you? Who has drawn you off track and pulled you off stray, off, off the track, right? Who told you that even though you started by depending in God, you now have to finish it with the flesh? Who told you that any power of the flesh was going to do you any good at all? That's what Paul was saying. So he spends a lot of time at that. And when we start to see in the stories in Scripture and in our history, and even in our own Advent history, how too often we have followed right down the path of building towers of Babel again in some fashion. And I, I've spent a lot of time asking the Lord because I'm slow. You know, Lord, I just want to know, how are we doing that now? And I, I asked him that for years before I finally realized the cold, critical spirit, the cold, critical spirit of Phariseeism is the work of Antichrist. Wait a minute. Then they don't have to come from Rome. They can come right here in this building. They can dwell right here in me. Because remember the story I told you about how when I was a teenager, oh yeah, look at all those people over there. Good thing I, I'm here to help them. Versus, Lord, change me because I'm a self-righteous, critical, judgmental. When people need us to be loving, gracious, and kind, speak the truth, yes, Warn them of the fact that the wages of sin is still death, yes, but present to them a God who is powerful enough and in love with them enough to heal them, to fix them, to change them. That is Christ. Antichrist is the opposite of that. <clears throat> so you say to me, well, Bobby, we, we got those kind of problems right here in our house. My husband's like that. My wife's like that. <laughs> that is true. That's the problem. Oh, well, we have that right here in our church. Yeah, that's the problem. So I want to give you a couple of fun things just here at the end, then I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions or anything else, or if you're ready to quit and go home, because I know you're tired. But here's something that's really helpful to me as you work with people. <clears throat> a few little skills to avoid the work of Antichrist. Someone comes to you, and they say, Karen, you know, uh, I, I just got to tell you this, because I'm concerned about my brother over there problem coming yep. yeah so you say stop i have to first ask you have you done every step of matthew 18 yet well matthew 18 what's that step one have you gone to them to talk about this don't talk to me about this 
This, this is not, I'm not the judge. I, I'm not the one who determines if they're a good person or bad person or in or out. That's not my job. Did you talk to them yet? And I'm not saying be critical of the one who's coming to you because now we're doing the same thing. <laughs> That's why the scripture says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. You see them having the problem, stop them and encourage them, please, please do not, do not disobey God. He said we are not to bear uh, a reproach is the King James word. Don't bear a reproach. That, what is bear a reproach? Bear a reproach means to listen to it. Go ahead, tell me what's the problem with that guy. Yep, okay, now I'm carrying it, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to unload it on you. That's bearing a reproach. <clears throat> tell them, stop. Have you done what the Lord... Well, who's the Lord? Well, the Lord's Jesus. Yeah, he's the guy who didn't do those kind of things. I mean, imagine if he did. He, at Simon's feast, oh, he could have really unloaded on Simon. He knew all about Simon. He knew Simon's the one that got Mary into that whole problem with prostitution in the first place, or, or whatever it was. I mean... I've heard some people say it wasn't what we call prostitutes today. But nonetheless, it was adultery. He's the one that got, Jesus knew that. Well, Jesus could have unloaded on him. Now, I know you guys here, you think you're all friends and buddies with Simon. You know, you're all Pharisees together. But let me tell you a little something about him. And I love the fact that as that story goes through, and Jesus does not do that, but instead he tells Simon this little, little uh, parable and Simon feeling, so, you know, when you say to a guy, hey, give me your, your evaluation of this. Give me your wisdom. So Simon, hey, yeah, I'll give you my wisdom. So he answers the question the Lord gives him, right, which was the, who will love the, the master more or who will love the, the one that's forgiven you more? Well, the one that's forgiven much will love much. And, and he's saying this, and in his mind he's thinking she's the much. She's the one that was forgiven much because, look, she's got lots of sin. That's what he was thinking. And after it came out of his mouth, it kind of went like a boomerang around the other side and then hit him right here. <laughs> That's the work of the Holy Spirit to say, Simon, oh, yeah. And then he realized the Lord knew everything. And if the Lord had been like any of his friends, he'd have been in big trouble. And Sister White says that, that Jesus won the heart of Simon by his kind, courteous treatment. And I'm thinking, yeah, but he's a sinner. What are you doing treating him like that? Yeah, that's it. He won him by his kind. He didn't leave Simon in his sin to die. He didn't leave him with no chance for rescue and no help and no hand reaching out, right? But he did it in such a way that his kind, courteous treatment, I mean, that's amazing. I don't didn't, I didn't even know how to do that. So we keep reading how Jesus did it, and we ask the Holy Spirit. I got a friend. This is prayer now. This is intercessory prayer. I got a friend and I watch them do this. I don't even know how to do that without being critical to talk to them about that. Thoughts from Out of Blessings. This is where I'm pulling some of this from. A little section called Moat in the Beam. If you think that you've got somebody that needs your help, read it. Uh, Moat in the Beam. Read it. And then read it again and pray about it and read it again because at the end of that little section, it's going to tell you, until you're ready to lay down your own self-dignity, even lay down your own life, to rescue your, your brother, you still got the beam stuck in your eye. Read it. You read over it and you say, Lord, I don't even know how to approach my friend, my, my elder, my pastor, my conference worker, or any, well, whoever they are, the person off the street. I don't know how to approach them like that. Yeah, because we don't have the mind of Christ. We can have the mind of Christ because right there we, op we can open up our mind and say, Lord, I, I, need to know how, I need to have that kind of love for them, that kind of tears for them. And we put it in a practical way, and we say, oh, so really what this means is me stop the critical, the judgmental, the gossip, and be converted, as he said to Peter. Afterwards, when you're converted, then you'll be able to feed my sheep and feed my lambs and care for my little ones. Right? That's what we need. And so in doing that, and, and it blew my mind the first time I realized that she was saying in that section, moting the beam, that our cold, critical, judgmental attitude towards others is antichrist. There's just larger and smaller versions of that. There's some who wear fancier outfits and carry a bigger stick or whatever. But it's all the same. 
It's all the same. If I come to you, set myself up as a standard and say, this is how you had better do it. And when you don't, then I'm going to go get some help. I'll get a couple of brothers with big sticks to come over here and we'll just, you know, get it, get it to you. And if, they, if that doesn't work, where do we usually go last? To the state or to the law. Oh, the scripture does say not to take your brother to law. Who's your brother? Yeah. I have people all the time say, no, no, that means believers. Don't take believers to court. The rest of them you can take to court. <laughs> well, yeah, we do the same thing the Pharisees do. <laughs> yeah, he said, love them and lay your life down for them. In, in the New Testament, it says, it'd be better that you be hurt and be harmed. Take the harm in order to reveal righteousness, in order to help them see what the character of God is like. That is what Jesus did. Turn the other cheek, right? See, all these things, they're in, in direct contrast with each other. But we're so busy worried about the guy over there that we don't see that, wait a minute, it's alive and well right here. It's alive and well in my home when I talk to my wife the way that I do or my husband the way that I do, right? Versus with that kind, courteous, gracious spirit of Jesus Christ. And here's what's amazing is the Lord is just asking us to, to, to recognize and accept we're right back to Daniel's prayer. Lord, I have sinned. And the whole of my people, from the top to the bottom, we spent a lot of time arguing about who's in charge, right? We got this whole ordination discussion going on. I'm not going to get into that and belabor it, except to say the whole discussion is still based, based and built on the premise of me in charge. The ordination of man is good for what? Nothing. Only thing that's useful is the ordination of God. When God places his spirit on a man or a woman like Ellen White and says to speak for me, sing about me, talk about me, share me with somebody else, oh yeah, the Pharisees always look at love to jump up and try to shut it down. It's always the way it's been. It's always the way it will be. But we're so busy having you know, uh, badges of, okay, you're, you're, you're this position, that position, the other position, now we got the club going on. And, and anybody else that wants to come in and try to be a part of that, no, they have to have my permission, because my name's Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> am, I, am I getting off track here, or are we still on the right point? See, because that starts to stump on our toes and hurt our, hurt our thoughts and our system. And I'm not trying to be hard on us, just to say, this is amazing that God goes on with patience with us. And then he goes on with, okay, today. Today, while it's called today, would you just look up? Look up here. Look at the pole where Christ is hanging. Look into his face. And then look at him get raised out of the tomb. That's even more exciting, right? Life after death. And hear him say, that's what I want to do to you. I want to speak that life into you, transform you, so that you no longer walk around weaving between Cain's altar, doing the thing over there, and then trying out Abel's altar now and again. That's what he wants to do. The whole battle as we come into the end of this thing is all about the truth about God versus all the lies. Truth about God versus all the lies. And those who accept and receive into them the life of God, the character of God, the mind of Christ. They will not lord it over each other, like Jesus told the disciples. Don't do that. The kings of the earth do that. Kings of the earth do that. You don't do that. You're all what? Brothers. You're all brothers, all sisters. And there comes the ability to have direct connection with God, because Jesus said, my father is not angry at you and driving you away. He wants you to come into his throne room and receive from him the spirit of loving sacrifice to lay down your life for those around you. Who are we marked with? One is the mark of Cain. One is the mark of Abel. One is the mark of Nebuchadnezzar versus Daniel. One is the mark of the Pharisees versus Jesus and one is the mark of self and self-righteousness versus humility and surrender to Christ. That has always been what the marks are about. We just got distracted for a while. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to close. <clears throat>
Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your love. Help us to see how this really applies in our, in our lives. How when we're at work, how when we're uh, going to the office, how when we're shopping at the grocery store, how when we're coming to church, that it is so common for us to have that little horn just alive and well in our hearts. You struck it with a deadly blow because you represented the truth about yourself to us, but it's not completely dead yet. We need you to destroy it in us. We need you to transform us and to fill us with the heart and mind of Christ so that we can love the people. And when we love them, then we'll have the right to speak the truth. And when we speak the truth in love, they will know that you truly love. So we thank you for that and for that opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.